I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I would be in full panic, full panic, like sobbing. I would go sit in a corner and I, I had experiences in my career that were far from okay, that involved other people and substance abuse and different things that I was reliving. Mm. And I was like, where the hell is this coming from? Caroline, thank you so much for coming on to At the End of the Tunnel. It is an honor to have you on and to, to, to hear more about your backstory. Uh, we've known each other for, I don't know what, six years or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe we met at the Mind Body Green um, conference in Arizona. And I don't know, we just kind of had like an affinity for one another. And then I happened to bump into you again. A few years ago, when I started working out at Deuce, um, Deuce Gym in Venice, which is right around the corner from my house. And, um, but at that point, you'd sort of transformed from when I first met you. You were kind of skinny, and then you were like super <laughs> crossfit <-y. laughs> You know, you had the quads yeah. and the, and the <laughs> lats. And I went from all the things, just like a superhero. <laughs> yeah, I went from wanting to shrink to slowly coming out of this little uh, cocoon that I yeah. had been living in. Yeah, when I met you, uh, that was a, a very challenging time. And, and I, of course, would have never admitted that. But that conference mm -hmm. was so special because I met some incredible people there that um, saw me for who I was and where I was at. And I remember being, oh my gosh, like I'm not my full self here. Like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not peppy Caroline. I don't, I don't even know how to be around people. I just want to run away to my room and sit in silence. <laughs> um, so it was nice. You know, Gretchen Blyler was another one that I really connected with there. Um, Olympic snowboarder and just being able to, to meet some people that I've had lifelong friendships with over a span of a quick 48 hours. So did fun. you know Rich Roll at the time, or did you guys meet at one of those conferences as well? We met, yes. So we actually knew each other through the grapevine. I, well, I, I knew of him through the grapevine of coaches and, and mentors that I had in swimming. And mm -hmm. then when I saw him there, it was like, Rich, oh my gosh, like I'm Caroline. And, and he, you know, we both knew Jack Roach, one of our mutual friends. And it was just an instant, like, you know each other forever. You've known each other for such a long time kind of feeling. But mm. the swimming world is a very small yet large world. So you kind of know who people are and you know what their impact is, and their influence, and, but you may not really know them until you meet them. And then when you meet them, you feel like you've known them forever. So um, yeah, that was the exact same place too. So it's a life. And Hillary Biscay was another one that mm -hmm. I connected with well there that was like, wait a minute, I feel like we've known each other forever. But yeah. Yeah. And were you a gifted athlete in general or were you, did you have specific uh, natural talent for swimming? And if so, what does that look like? Swimming is a very specific sport. So <laughs> it's interesting because for being a tomboy, I remember playing soccer. And the reason I didn't end up continuing playing soccer is because there was just too much aggression and Mm -hmm. I did my bow would fall out of my hair. So I didn't like that at the time, you know, I had this, this bow headband thing. And, and I remember my, my mom has video, you know, where I'm like fixing my bow in the middle of the game when I should be going to get the ball, you know, it's like right there. And that's my, my job at that point in time. So I remember, you know, swimming, swimming is a very specific sport and that you are, you're wet, you're cold. There's a lot of dedication that goes into it. You got to wake up early and I somehow liked that, but I do think paired with that was this natural gift, but swimming was never a sport to me. And this is a brand new awakening that I've had the past couple of years that the reason why I always felt sort of out of place is because I saw everything as art or creativity and swimming to me was an art form. It was a way for me to express myself using my body and, and doing so in a way that was fluid and doing so in a way that felt natural to me. I had that affinity for the water. The water felt safe, felt like home. 
And so because I felt so free in that space, I was able to express myself, which again, came a little bit, uh, you know, it was more of a challenge to me in school or in friendship circles to like, talk, you know, express myself through, through something on land. It just didn't feel the same. So once I could start to figure that out, I was like, this is for me. Swimming is for me. Um, yeah, it was a very fluid art form Mm -hmm. that I innately knew I had that, that feeling about it was hard to Mm -hmm. explain to anybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I I couldn't have articulated that at age 12, you know, (laughs) I can imagine um, my dad was an attorney and he, all he talked about was, oh, you need to be in business for yourself and whatnot. Your mom was a pro tennis player, right? So obviously she excelled to the highest levels of that. When you were a kid, what was your impression of success? And did you see yourself as a child taking swimming to the highest levels? Like, was that one of your goals just as a, as a side effect of growing up with parents who had done the same thing? I actually grew up with maybe two or three role models in swimming, Mm -hmm. two or three idols, but the idols that I remember were tennis players. So, you know, we would watch the Williams sisters and Steffi Graf and Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras. And I remember just we would go to us open and I, you know, I was very into that and I liked their outfits and the way they carried themselves. And I, I remember feeling that from them, you know, but I didn't know the score. I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and so when I think about what my drive was and, and thinking about what it was that I was, I was looking to accomplish even in the sport of swimming, like, why did I want to do it? What was my, reason what was my why I honestly just wanted to feel the way that they felt and and the way they felt was my perception of the way they felt Mm -hmm. but seeing the joy seeing the fun and not really understanding what all went into it (laughs) and what all was going on I remember those were the things and that was what I wanted And I couldn't have told you, I want medals. I couldn't have told you, I want to feel famous or I I want to feel um, successful with accolades and times and, and, and money and all these things. You know, I think as I got into my teens, I just wanted to feel the way that they felt. And if somebody asked me what that was, how does Pete Sampras feel or how to, how does Venus Williams feel? like well she's just happy because she has she gets to pick her outfits and she gets to she gets to show up to you know those literally were my answers and that would frustrate people because they're like what why what is your reason here um and so yeah I, I can go on a million different tangents with that but I think when did it occur to you how much work would be involved in getting to that level my, um, actually, I don't know what year I was in high school, but maybe a freshman, I was 13 mm-hmm. and I made the junior national cut in breaststroke, which was not even what I ended up being an Olympic athlete. And I was this little 13 year old and I walked over to my coach who, you know, at the time was like a big, scary guy, but so nice. And I loved him so much. And he was like a big dad, you know, big teddy bear. But now looking back, best coach I've ever had in my life. Um, And I said, I'm not ready to go. This is like right after I made it. When you make a cut in swimming, it's just like track, right? You make a cut or sectionals or junior nationals or or senior nationals. Track and swimming are like almost the exact same as far as setup. You go to the meet. And I would have been the youngest there from Lakeside, my club team, by like three years. Everybody Mm -hmm. was 16 and older. And I said, I'm not going. I was so adamant. <laughs> he said, why? I said, I'm not ready. And he looked at me and I'll never forget this. I was at the University of Kentucky pool. And he looked at me and he goes, all right. It's up to you. Know, it's up to you. You figure out why you're not ready. And we'll, we'll talk about it later. And I remember being like, what? <laughs> that was easy enough, you know, but 
he was giving me the autonomy to figure out why I wasn't ready and what it was that I needed to, to do. And there's, you know, swimming is a high pressure sport. Like there, I, I don't give myself enough credit sometimes for how much pressure goes into it at a young age. And I'm 13 years old and I'm making this cut that here I am to go to this meet, one of the youngest in the nation to go. And, and I didn't want to go because I wasn't ready. And he's giving me the autonomy. And I remember in that moment thinking, I'm going to be good. <laughs> like I'm going to be good. And that's terrifying. And it's not that I'm not ready to go physically because I know I can do it and I know my body's capable of it, but I, I'm not ready to go because I don't really believe that I can perform at the same level as these other athletes can. So I was putting myself very low on the mm-hmm. ability scale compared to the rest of the athletes in the world. Um, so I didn't go. <laughs> and then that was- So your parents one. signed off on this executive decision that you made? Or you, they didn't know that you had this invitation to go to this thing. Well, I'm sure there were some conversations with with them and my coach behind the mm-hmm. scenes, but <laughs> I remember them just saying, okay, well then let's set your sights on the next one and let's figure mm-hmm. out how you can get there. So the mm-hmm. next one um, was in Gainesville, Florida, which is where I went, ended up going to college. Mm-hmm. I was 15 and I made the next one in freestyle, which is what I would end up doing for the rest of my career. It's what I'd specialize in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did that in my, you know, in our home pool. And so I remember going to that, um, same, same mentality to be totally honest, but a step in the right direction that I showed up and got dead last at the meet in my race on purpose. No, <laughs> <laughs> Cause I know you told stories about how you would let people <laughs> beat you sometimes. Cause you would feel bad, feel bad. That was definitely a thing for sure. That I, I was so nervous at that mm-hmm. meet and my nerves came from people pleasing, which is a direct, you know, here we go back to the conversation we just had about childhood, making sure everyone's okay. You know, I, I, I feel like the society and kind of the, the message that I grew up in and that a lot of women grew up in it, that are my age or make everyone happy, be a good girl, do what you need to do. And please don't upset anybody. Like just, just don't. So that message can, can be put into my sport unknowingly unbeknownst to me, you know, it's the subconscious experience that seeps into everything in life which is why I would let people beat me because I don't want them to be mad at me and why I would, you know, make sure that I, I didn't step on any toes in my friend circles and all these things. Same thing with competition. I'd get to the meet and I'd be so afraid to let anybody down. And I'd be so afraid to do something poorly because what would that mean about me? And I remember being so young thinking all of these things, like I don't want to upset anybody. I have to do well because if I don't, that would mean I'm not making somebody happy. Hmm. Meanwhile, no one's specifically telling me this. Like at that age, you know, that changed in college, but at that age, no one was specifically telling me this. Nobody, Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. one person was like, I'll be very upset with you. (laughs) Like not one person. So I had this belief system and had created these stories at a young age that I wasn't going to make people happy if I didn't perform well. Mm -hmm. So enter the achievement mindset, you know, enter doing more and more and more and more to try and get love and prove yourself. And then, you know, down the road, that's how it all panned out for a long time. Also at this time, having qualified for the junior nationals at 13 and all is that is the olympics even in the conversation at this point is this something that you are have set your your sights or your parents or your coach have to set their sights on for you and and they're kind of grooming you for this path i think yes yes but not verbalized the first time it was verbalized was when i did go to that gainesville meet the senior Mm -hmm. nationals meet and I didn't do well, but it was that time where it was like, you're good enough to make the Olympic team. 
And the conversation that my club coach, Mike DeVore consistently had with me on a regular basis was you have to believe that you're good enough to make that Olympic team. Mm. And that conversation continued for a long time until I went to college and then it continued, but it was delivered in a different way. So I went to Olympic trials for the first time before my freshman year of college. And that was in long beach, California. And that was when I got, I don't know, ninth or 10th. So I was like a young buck still. I think I was 16, just maybe just turned 17. I was a young college kid too, like young freshman. And that was when I really knew that that moment right there was, I know that I can make the 2018. And this was 2004 when I, when I realized that like, I'm good enough. I just don't, I, I, there's a lot of mental things <laughs> and, and, you know, this mind body connection thing started to get come in the picture and it started to become, I would sense when I wasn't confident, I would feel it. And, and, um, that meet was a big eye-opening experience to me that in four years from now, I could be standing on that podium going to the Olympics. So what do I do? <laughs> what, what do I do now? What are the intangibles? Like if you're placing ninth and yet you want to make the Olympic team, what, 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 what one have to focus on, um, to, to bridge that gap? I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is figuring out what is your story as to why you, you can't, mm -hmm. because I think every single athlete in the history of sports at some point has believed that they they can't do it. <laughs> like at some point their internal belief system is I am not going to be capable of doing this. Even if it's a 20 second conversation, with themselves, but there's, there's always that inner gremlin and that, that little devil that sits on the shoulder that says like, you're not good enough. So I had to address that and I had to figure out what that was, which took a long time, <laughs> almost all the way up until the next Olympics. Uh, I think obviously from a standpoint of physical, bringing the physical in, you have to understand what your body needs. You have to understand how to train. You have to understand how to recover not be an asshole and, and eat shit. And, you know, like you've got to learn how to treat your body. Like it's this precious vessel that you are going to use and, and uh, celebrate as something that can get you from point A to point B in the pool. And also win medals if you really want, but, but feel strong and sturdy and successful. So I had to address that because I had never lifted weights before. This was before college. I was too scared of getting big, which is a whole nother conversation for another day. Uh, don't get me started on that one. But, you know, that, that was another piece. And then I would say the third piece was starting to really figure out who my support system was, how to communicate with them, how to have conversations that were a bit more mature as an athlete, sit down and talk about the hard stuff, take into account, you know, what's going on in your life, communicate it, mm -hmm. ask for help when you need help. I didn't know these things then, but I did my best with all three of those. And college was a roller coaster of working through those three things to get to where I needed to be. And I failed at every single one of them numerous times until I got to a point where I could figure out how to keep them all at an equilibrium and check the boxes, but, but keep them steady and not just done, done, you know, keep it steady day by day, one day at a time, one month at a time, you know, one meet at a time and stay on that path. Do you have like a, any semblance of a normal young person's life? Are you out dating? Are you going out to restaurants with people, your friends, birthday, you're going to go out to 20 friends for my birthday, or is this like <laughs> a full-time job? level pursuit where you're just no one knows where you are you're always in the pool you're always training or is there's something in between full-time pursuit um I also didn't uh choose 
in high school to have that kind of life. I think I mm-hmm. went to one dance. <laughs> I had a boyfriend on the high school team. I think we went to two movies, you know, or on our club team. The, the mentality is so different, I think, for uh, maybe eight, teens now than it was then as well. You know, we didn't mm-hmm. have the same kinds of stimuli from social media and comparisons and things like that. It existed, but it wasn't the same. So no, I didn't. And when you're in college, you are a unit. Your team is a unit. You date everybody on the team. Those are your people. It's just one big happy family. And that has its pros. It has its cons, but you are in a bubble and not just swimming, but the athletic community in general. So, you know, mm-hmm. My my sweet mates were Joe Kim Noah and Al Horford. <laughs> like, wow. You know, it's it's like a it's a funny, it's just so funny to think about, you know, like they're like literally two doors down the hall, like and we all share the same common room. And they're just we're freshmen, like they weren't who they are now, you know, that we didn't know any of these things, but th- this is the life, like you are in a pod of people, you're quarantined. Mm-hmm. You wake up, you go to pr- practice, you go to school, you go to practice. You go to training center, you go to dinner, you go to bed. That's it. Day after day. You party Saturday night. This is college I'm talking about, obviously. I didn't party at all in high school. I didn't even know. I was too afraid. I... But, you know, that that's your unit. And what's the really mental health situation like at this, at this point? Uh, in college? Mm-hmm. Uh, not great for me. (laughs) Uh, my college years were extremely tough and I put on a happy face, but they were tough for me. Um, there were a lot of different variables that went down, um, from relationships to coaching relationships, um, to sickness, illness, uh, eating disorder behavior, Uh, I had an incredible academic advisor who at the time served as a counselor for all of us. The conversation of mental health was nowhere to be found except for with him. Hmm. He was ahead of the times. (laughs) You know, this is this 2004, 2005, sorry, 2005 to 2009. And I'm sure you can also remember, you know, this conversation wasn't, this wasn't prevalent. You can talk about it, but the tangible tools and understanding how to actually make the changes was not in the conversation. Right. Uh, So I, I battled deeply and I had a very difficult time with my self-confidence, with my body, with emotional abusive relationships, with other abusive relationships. And it was all over my head because I was like, oh, this is normal. (laughs) If I'm just having a hard time, I just need to go talk to Tim, suck it up, you know, and move forward the next day. And I did. um, But in you know, I, I, until I took a radical responsibility for what I needed to change and how I needed to structure my life there, I, I really was playing this victim role and, and didn't know how to do anything. Um, and that was like around sophomore year where it was just like complete depression. Uh, mm-hmm. I was sick the whole time. I had lost a lot of weight, um, had a very difficult time with a lot of other situations that I spent probably half the year crying <laughs> or, or figuring out, you know, I don't say that lightly. I'm just, I think back to it and I'm like, Oh, if I could have just given this girl a hug and, and actually sat down with her and understood what was going on. Cause I didn't have any of the tools, any of the language, any understanding of what I was experiencing other than whatever it is, is weak and you need to get over it. And you need to move forward. In the meantime, there's this buildup. The Olympics are coming. The Olympics are about to happen, right? And you'd already qualified, I believe, at this point uh, for the 2008. How, how early do you qualify for the, for the Olympics? A year we before? Didn't, no, actually, we didn't qualify until the summer after my senior year. So okay. that was, so you qual- swimming is interesting. You qualify and then you go straight there. Wow. 
you don't have a break. <laughs> like literally so, like a couple of weeks later, you're at the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So we okay. packed our bags for trials as if you could make it and you're never coming back basically for like two months. So you graduated first and then you went to the Olympics? I did not graduate until I had a semester left because I took okay. a lot of time off that summer to train for the trials. So I, t- I had a semester left after the Olympics. Right. Yeah. So on the, on the surface, you're like showing up, you're smiling, you're there, you're committed, you're competing, but in the background, you're crying and mm-hmm. feeling depressed and everything that comes with that. Yeah. And I, I didn't have, like I said, I didn't have the language to share or to ex- explain what was going on. Mm-hmm. I felt everything it was like everything felt sticky and uncomfortable and like I was wading through molasses all the time and I didn't know how to articulate myself with what I was experiencing and if I did I wouldn't I was too afraid to I didn't know how to do that uh and I think the you know we had incredible seniors on our team that would would sit and talk with me and when I was younger and I remember getting to be a senior and being like, now I'm the one that's supposed to be the role model for everybody. And I'm having a hard time. And so then you, you enter that territory of, well, I can't possibly be struggling. I'm the one that has to be sharing the positivity. Right. So I, I really did put my blinders on and did the best that I could. And, and looking back, I do wonder, and this is kind of why I've, dedicated my life from then until now to what I do, because I would have actually had the tools to understand how to regulate myself and to understand how to work through difficult times and take radical responsibility for how I feel and move forward in a way that felt productive. Like how much better could I have been? Mm. And that's the other conversation that, you know, you can do the what ifs for days, but that really struck me as, as their there has to be a better way to understand what athletes go through from pressures of performance to personal relationships, to coaching relationships, to nutrition and body image and the conversation around that, especially swimmers and gymnasts and people in no clothes. You know, these types of conversations are real. It's real. And I think what happens when we don't have the tools and the language to articulate it is we fall victim to these scenarios because we don't know how, how to process them. So it's just like, this is all happening to me and I don't know what to do. And so I'm going to give up. And our first instinct as humans is we either, you know, you go in fight or flight and you overcorrect everything or you shut down. And so I got really good at shutting down and tuning into what I needed to do. So I was able to make the Olympic team and do all these things because I could shut down all the pain that I was experiencing. Didn't deal with it. That didn't work, by the way, <laughs> but, it, but it, it worked in the moment. It worked for me to get to where I needed to be. So not having those tools to understand how to work through that was a detriment in the long run. And it also could have helped me regulate my system and my nervous system and my ability to perform a lot better if I would have known how to do that, mm-hmm. which I think is still an evolving conversation to this day. It's like, here's the issue. Now, what do we do about it? <laughs> right. And even the academic advisor, he didn't kind of tell you, Hey, everybody's going through this. You're not the only one. Um, he did. He was awesome. He, he was awesome. I think the the disconnect there is that, um, you know, there's only so much he can do. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, he has his boundaries he has to keep as an academic advisor. And so there's only so much that you can get out of, of people in that environment, especially as a young woman with older men that are basically, I I didn't have any, I would one female coach, you know, so I didn't really know who to trust and who to confide in at the time right. with the things right. that I was personally going through as a young woman. Talk about uh, your discovery of visualization and how that transformed your approach to mm. your swimming. It was actually a brilliant discovery because it was something that came naturally to me. Um, it started in high school with the coach that I told you was the best coach I've ever had. 
we used to do visualiz visualization exercises that we all scoffed at, you know, laughed and thought it was silly and dumb. And, you know, this is like, what, 1999 or so, you know, and we're all laying on the floor of the, of the team room at the pool. And he's turning on these tape cassettes and we're listening to uh, goal setting and visualization. And I remember thinking it was silly, but for some reason I felt very connected to the process of that. Fast forward uh, in college, <clears throat> when we started to have, this is about my junior year, when we started to have more mature conversations mm -hmm. about how to perform optimally. And, and we'd have individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with our specialty coach. So there's, you know, five coaches on staff and you have like a specialty coach for your specific area. I remember the conversation between us was in a nutshell, you know, you don't understand times or stats. And I said, yes, that's me. I don't, I don't operate that way. So let's use visuals. Let's use markers. Let's use images. I said, all right, I'm game. Let's do it. So from that day on, what we did was instead of applying it in a way that would be more of a meditative sitting down and visualizing my first experience with visualization was actually during practices. Hmm. So we'd go into our specialty groups and, you know, you kind of like four people over here, four people over here. And we do different sets that were, you know, um, catered to our events. And the, the instructions that were given to me started to become, all right, Caroline, Caleb Pearsall, this person is two legs ahead of you. All you see is whitewash. You know, that means like kick, like you're behind or, you know, um, and I want you to roll on the turn, like tumbleweed, you know, like he would start saying things that would be images for me, or like, mm. I want you to snowball this, which means like, as it gets bigger, the snowball gets bigger, you get faster, you know, different things like that. You give me tempo talk. So he'd talk about my tempo and, and it's a pendulum. Okay. Pendulum's getting faster. I was able to perform with these types of images and all of a sudden I'm, you know, what, 18 years old. And I'm like, wait a minute. I finally understand myself as an athlete and I think this is going to help me. And so I utilized that for the remainder of my senior year. And that was my real, my first real experience of that was actually a application and not just a sit and think about it. It was an application physically so I became so connected to the physical experience of the visualization mm -hmm. and it was a game changer for me. And I think it clicked that it was okay that I was the way I was. It was okay that I was a feeler. It was okay that I thought about images and visualization. It worked. It was okay. And that moment I think was a big catalyst to the rest of my success in making the Olympic team. So I was able to visualize what was, was going on instead of mm -hmm. just trying to think of it in this linear fashion that I was supposed to think about it in. Yeah. And you ended up on the team with Michael Phelps. You ended up meddling at that uh, Beijing Olympics. I think a lot of us can imagine what that must be like leading up to an event of such magnitude, but what is it like after the Olympics, mm -hmm. after you come home um, because you retired yourself from competitive sports not long after that. So something apparently went down. <laughs> so talk a little bit well, about that moment in time. You know, I was listening to the Jewel podcast with Joe Rogan. This is actually one that I did listen to. I listened to over a span of a couple of days on a couple of walks mm -hmm. with my new little puppy. Um, and she said something that struck me, finally made sense to me as far as why I retired quote unquote from swimming I never wanted to be this one trick pony in my mind not that people that specialize in sport are that I'm not saying that at all I just didn't want that to be my only existence and I think from such a young age you know backtracking and rewinding to my childhood where I did feel this sense of um, acceptance and 
experience and feel and understanding that sport is a, an art for me, that swimming was an art. Um, my motivation wasn't to continue to climb that ladder and continue to succeed in that way. I had this wake up call. Um, you know, I obviously went through a really difficult time in my career, especially when I left Florida, there was a lot of very rough things going on at the pro team that I trained at with the coach and, um, and, uh, I remember retiring and, and just knowing that I have no idea what I'm going to (laughs) do. I don't really know what's next, but I know that I'm not going to be happy chasing this exact thing over and over and over again. And knowing that the result will feel the exact same way it felt when I was standing on the podium in Beijing. And that was just what I thought at the time. Maybe it wouldn't have. The experience could have been different. But to me, it was like that feeling standing on the podium, that feeling of winning, that feeling of I just won. This is freaking amazing. Oh, my God. It's fleeting. Mm. It lasts a day. And even at that, I remember I used to have family and friends frustrated at me because I didn't want to talk about it. So when I put all these pieces of the puzzle together and I realized that the result will continue to yield the same feelings, that this isn't what it's all about. There has Mm -hmm. to be a different meaning to life, to sport, to experience that I haven't even seen yet. And this is just a platform. I was like, all right, let's do this. It was not pretty (laughs) because that was my relationship for 25 years of my life, but it was extremely necessary for me Mm -hmm. to grow and evolve. And I was so interested in evolution of that. I was so interested in evolving myself as a human being because I knew I didn't know it all. I knew I didn't have every tool that I, that I was capable of having in my tool belt. And I didn't want to wake up in another 10 years and say, well, what if I would have done that? What if I would have done that? I was completely okay with what I had accomplished. Mm -hmm. It was hard. It was not easy. I cried. I cried. I cried. Um, And I went through several, several, several years of very depressed and difficult emotions. And when you say very depressed, what are we, what are we talking about on the spectrum of depression? Were you having suicidal ideations or was there like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nights where yeah. you had to call hotlines and stuff like that? Absolutely. The hotline stuff came later. That mm-hmm. came a long time after, but the, the initial retirement phase, <laughs> retirement, such a funny word for athletes, like I'm retired, I'm 25, you know? Well, you graduated yourself from... <laughs> I transitioned. Yeah. Yeah. I transitioned. And the first, I want to say from 2010 to 2015, 16 were the overcompensation. How can I prove myself? How can I Mm. do what I did and get that same high? How can I chase that same feeling? Who's going to notice me now? How can I find it simultaneously? I'm like, how can I hide? How can I make sure nobody sees that I'm not achieving what I achieve? Oh no, now I'm failing. So what I do, I chased everything possible. I did a million running races. I went to two different graduate programs. <laughs> I finished them both. I, I loved it. You know, they're all part of my life now, but there was an, a pivotal moment at the end of my last graduate program where my instructor or my teacher looked at me, professor looked at me and said, stop collecting things and start doing and living and being and she was a very spiritual professor like she was she was you know and I was like so offended I was like what do you mean everyone's been so proud of me that's what people have said to me you know like I'm so proud of you for going to do this and getting that degree and doing it." it was 
the conversation was rarely around like, how are you really? Mm. How is your experience there? Really? Not what are you doing? How much have you achieved and done? Did you ever feel like swimming was like your life's purpose? And if not, did you have any idea what that could have been at that point in your life? No, I d- it definitely wasn't my life's purpose. And I knew that from a young age. Um, I didn't know what it was. I knew, oh, and this is such an interesting, this is such an interesting topic here because I think something that has brought me a lot of shame. And I talked to Salema about this at one point, actually, mm-hmm. is that I'm, I'm a polymath. I have a lot of things I could do and that I want to do. And that is a bit frowned upon and can be in society back then. If you don't go get the degree, get the job, the nine to five, where you succeed and do that thing. Mm -hmm. And I still have moments of that. I still don't feel understood. And I actually still feel that if I had something more understood about what I do, that that would be more acceptable in society. And I know you and I have had this conversation personally as well. So I, I, I finished not knowing what my purpose was or what I was supposed to do. And that's a very common feeling for a lot of athletes, because I think what a lot of athletes experience is that you're really good at what you do because it comes to you in a very natural way. And then to find something that comes to you in a very natural way, again, is, is, can be difficult. Mm -hmm. And if it comes to you in a natural way and it's not what society deems as successful, then that causes some problems for, for whether it's family or friends or or whatever it is, people, what do you, what do you mean you're going to go be an artist or what do you mean you're going to design clothes or what do you mean, you know, is that, is that going to make money? And so I started doubting myself and those what was, doubts. What, what was the takeaway from the whole, like when you look at the body of your body of work as a swimmer leading up to the Olympics and then you transitioning out of that to this next stage in your life, which essentially is like a rebirthing. What was, what was a positive takeaway from the, cause you, you described some kind of experiences like maybe insecurities and all this but what was some something from that body of work that you thought okay I could really apply this to helping people or finding something that feels more aligned or something like that aside from like the hard work stuff because I think that's kind of a common thing but were there any yeah. intangibles I was very like curious. not maybe not hiding my feelings this time I'm going to just yeah. be transparent you know I was very curious as to why and how different people operated. So I think when I was in the sport of swimming, I took very close note at how every athlete operated. Certain Mm -hmm. ones operate this way. Other ones operate this way. There's type A's there's out in the clouds. There's, you know, there's, there's so many different styles, personality styles. And I was very connected empathically to that experience with a lot of, of my peers. And so that turned into this passion for understanding why and how we can all achieve a similar goal, doing it differently. And I honestly think that that's been a big driver for a lot of my life is how can we figure out how to do things our own way And whatever result that yields is your own result and your own success. And just because Sally or Joe don't do it that way and they yield a result or success doesn't mean that you're not successful. Mm -hmm. And that's been an extremely challenging thing to learn. But I, I do think that that's one of the biggest lessons that I have taken was just feeling so empathically my peers and how everyone has done something differently and be able to apply that to my life now and to understand how to accept that better, that not everyone's going to fit in the same box. Not everyone's going to do something the way you want them to do it. Not everyone is going to have 
this path the way I want them to have it, you know? And so it checks me. I have to check myself there. I have to check uh, my biases. I have to check my preconceived conditioning. And I, I would hope that I, I can create that. And that's kind of what we've created with our business is that there's just so many different ways to, whoo, there goes my, my little dog. <laughs> there's so many different ways to do that. Um, that, that was the biggest thing I think for me, mm-hmm. it was never about the actual thing. It was about something else every time. Well, in a way it's, it's still a carryover from your childhood days when you were doing mm-hmm. the same thing on the playground, mm-hmm. you know, except maybe you didn't have the language for it at the time. And maybe yeah. you didn't see the importance of experiencing all sides of it so that you could be of service to other people, to younger people. Um, yeah. who, who didn't, who don't have those, those tools. And, yeah. and so you get an opportunity to give them those tools, but leading up to that, to what you're doing now, there's this bit of a montage of, you know, you recognizing that you're in a dorsal state, your body's really off. You have to repair that. You have to basically mm-hmm. find yourself again, which is really bizarre, you know, cause yeah, again, from the outside looking in, you think, okay, someone who's been to the Olympics, they, they are, the most focused, the most hardworking, they are the most successful. And this really not, that's not what's happening behind mm-hmm. the scenes mm-hmm. after the fact. So you kind of have to mm-hmm. rebuild, the, take all the Legos apart and then reconstruct yourself again yeah. in a completely different identity. So what were some of the, the, um, the milestones along that path of reconstruction? Mm. So I moved out here. I, first of all, I've lived in way too many places and you might, you might be laughing because you're like, no, not as many as me. (laughs) But, um, I, I moved out here and my whole mission was, okay, put your feet in the ground. You've been running. You've been in fight or flight. You've been trying your hardest to find who you are as a human being. And put your feet in the ground. Let's establish something. Let's establish a little community. You've lived in six places so far since you've left. You don't seem happy anywhere, you know? Um, And right before quarantine, I hit this very dark space. And this was 2019. Mm -hmm. I got concussed. And the classic saying, you got to hit yourself over the head to realize something (laughs) was the most (laughs) true comment I've ever experienced. And it was this moment of, oh my God, I really have to make some life changes here. Cause I had lived running. I had, um, been struggling with food. I, I wasn't fueling myself. I didn't feel worthy. I couldn't, I couldn't open up in relationships. I couldn't, I was, I was shut down. My body was shut down completely. I wasn't opening myself to any experiences. So I hit myself over the head. I mean, I cracked my skull open and it was the first time in my life when I couldn't even formulate a sentence or have a conversation with somebody. Literally when you get concussed, Mm -hmm. it's very difficult. And it was through that time that I got reconnected with my art that I started to come into my body more since I couldn't intellectualize things like society wanted me to try and do for the past five years, you know, Mm -hmm. and all these things that felt natural to me as a swimmer started to come back a little bit and everything came up. It was like my skull and my brain were shaken and everything came up, everything in my life, every abusive situation, um, depression, darkness that I experienced in swimming. And after it was like just volcanic eruption and I could hardly control it. Like it was, I was afraid I was broken. Like something was extremely wrong with me. I wasn't able to have, um, I wasn't able to actually focus on who I was. I wasn't able to focus on work. I wasn't able to, um, do anything really. And I felt like, this is it. Like I'm, I'm a problem. 
and sorry about her. That's your dog. Hear, so if you can fine. hear that, she yeah, just no, woke up. Yeah. Um, I started to have episodes that were extremely difficult for me. This was like 2019. This was right before quarantine. Mm -hmm. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I would be in full panic, full panic, um, like sobbing. I would go sit in the corner and I, I had experiences in my career that were far from okay, that involved other people and substance abuse and different things that I was reliving. Mm. And I was like, where the hell is this coming from? I was terrified. These were the moments I would call the hotline. I needed somebody to talk to at midnight. I didn't know what to do. I was completely destroyed inside. And I would be curled up in a ball with a blanket over my head, just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Like, what, who am I? What is the point of all this? Like, what am I doing here? There's no mm. point. Like, I'm not successful. Like I was like, is this, you know, is our business going to work? It, um, I, I didn't know how to, to operate in society. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I would hide. I would stay I quarantined far before the quarantine happened. Um, and I just, I, 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 it's so hard to explain because it's such a visceral experience of what this feels like. And it was essentially what you, one would call a mental health crisis. I mean, I was, I was in a very dark place. And so that's when I started to seek help in a way that was different than I had before. I had been in therapy and I had done coping mechanisms per se, but I had never actually dealt with the things and dug them up and, and, and healed them. Mm -hmm. So I sought help and, and seeked out help and, and found a somatic experiencing practitioner and started doing some very deep, very deep work. Um, EMDR, like lots of, of um, like recalling past events and working through them. And it was gnarly. <laughs> it was gnarly. Um, and before quarantine, obviously when you have in-person sessions, there would be days when I, I couldn't like let her near me. And, you know, I, I, I was so, um, I was boiling inside that took about two years to get through. So like right when quarantine hit right about the beginning to the middle was when it started to really make sense. Hmm. And I think that last stretch of it was when I really healed a lot of the things that I went through. Um, and I isolated myself. I tell you what, people were like, what, where is she? What is she doing? What's wrong with her? She hasn't come home. She's not talking to us. Like, you know, and I, I, I couldn't bring up what I was going through. Like I, I couldn't see out of my own two eyes and ears and brain. Like I was stuck so incredibly stuck and to talk about it would bring it all up even more. And I was already doing that. Um, yeah. I have a question for, for layers. someone <laughs> layers on layers there <laughs> for someone who may be experiencing something similar, right? What is, what is a hotline experience like? And, and was there anything specifically helpful that you found when you would call that would help kind of get you off the ledge? First of all, it's terrifying to call mm -hmm. um, the amount of times I actually almost didn't and, and then ended up putting my phone down and calling a friend instead, which is also wonderful. But when I, when I called the hotline, it was finally a time when I could take radical responsibility for myself. And it felt like it was someone wasn't going to save me because I couldn't be um, you know, I could hurt to this person and they don't know me, but I couldn't be a victim to my own lack of accountability. Like they hold you accountable. This person, I had a woman every time somehow that answered the phone. And every time she answered the phone, it was this like, this, this experience where they don't know anything about you, but they're not going to let anything happen to you in a way that's this, you know, when you share something with a stranger, sometimes it has a different effect, right? Because they don't know what you've gone through. They don't know you, but when they say something, you're just like, 
I haven't heard that before. <laughs> I haven't heard this angle before. And in a lot of those moments, I couldn't, art- I couldn't understand or articulate what I was even experiencing. I would just cry. And I, I, I'll, I tend to go to corners or bathrooms whenever I'm hurting. Like I'll sit on the floor in a corner in a bathroom. And I spend a lot of time in the corners of bathrooms talking to, cause that was, it's a long story about why, but talking on the phone and, and long story short, it, it's a, it's a very terrifying experience, but it holds you accountable in a way that you feel seen, held, understood, and they check in on you and they allow you to be who you are. And, and you don't even have to see this person ever again. It's like, mm. you don't, you don't have to feel like you approve your, anything to them. Like I'm fine. It's fine. I'm fine. You know, sometimes that can be the message that I would give my friends. And this woman wouldn't allow me off the hook every time or the person that I talked to, like, you're not fine. Let's talk about it. You know, but I think the, the, when you, when you have people close to you in your life, you don't want them to worry about you as much so that my tendency personally, and this is just my experience, perhaps others can relate to this is that I'm fine. Everything's fine. No, it's, it's okay. You don't want to share some things because you don't want them to worry about you. I didn't want my brother and my family to worry about me. I never shared any of this stuff with them. And so for some reason, opening up to someone that doesn't know me felt safe because I didn't have to to prove myself, which was the whole thing I had to work through in the first place. Um, But it's a blessing. It's there. It's a blessing that it's available. Um, can also text them take longer, but, um, it, it felt scary, but safe for me. And, um, yeah, so many layers to it all that are impossible to share in such a short time. But I think, you know, I, I always feel so deeply for, for those that are suffering and, and struggling and having a really difficult time because, the internal message is I'm broken. I'm, I'm worthless. I don't have a reason to be here. I don't, um, you know, you're so wrapped up in your own mind and in your own experience and you forget the things that you do do well Mm -hmm. and the person you are to other people. And, um, it's a spiral a spiral that's hard to get out of and and that doesn't mean you're broken it just means that you're finally really in my opinion I think a lot of people should know that when you're in those moments you're probably on the brink of something pretty spectacular if you can just continue to move this energy out of your body and through it and 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 talk to people ask for help like work through it in a way that is, I am not helpless. I am not broken. I am having a really hard time with whatever it is, addiction or depression or, or whatever it is. Those, those moments, those pivotal chaotic moments can actually be hugely informational when you look at them in hindsight, it's hard to see that in the moment, but it's a feeling. So how how would you articulate your mission these days? Mm. These are always hard questions for me. (laughs) You would. (laughs) Um, I want to, and and my work mission and and my personal mission are very similar. Mm -hmm. I want to assist human beings to understand the way they operate and that um, allow them to tap into how they, they feel and use that as information because our bodies hold a lot of that information. A lot of athletes are afraid to feel, or if they feel they push it down because that means they're weak. But my mission is to allow ourselves to understand how we can utilize feelings as information. It's not something to shame or, or get trapped in, but it's something to utilize and bring to the surface so we can identify what we need to take responsibility for, what things we can change in our lives and what things we can learn how to let go of and, and walk away from if we need to. 
And I think that's one of the telltale signs of someone who has indeed found their purpose is that their personal mission and their work mission are aligned. And, um, and so that obviously was the, the mission behind RISE as well, right? Mm -hmm. To work with younger athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also wanted to provide a space for these Olympic and pro athletes to give back because mm -hmm. the the message when we were done was like, what do we do? We don't want to be coaches. Mm -hmm. Sure, a lot of them are. That's great. But most of them are like, I don't want to coach. Like, tell me what to do, you know? And so we created this business because a lot of them want to work with athletes. They want to work on their mindsets, want to help them understand themselves a lot better as athletes. And you know, obviously we saw it this summer at the Olympics. We've seen it over and over again. If we can instill this at a foundational level, everything will get better. And that is across the board in society right now. If it can be instilled at a foundational level, if we can understand human beings better and help them understand themselves, like what a difference they can make in the world with others, with themselves, with their sports, with their careers, with their purpose. Um, and what better way to do that than through experiential learning itself. I think we have enough information in this world and not enough actual connection about the things that truly matter mm -hmm. deep down. That was the goal. So there's, there's a better way. There's a better way to do this and we're going to make it because what's the saying, if you don't find something that's not there, you better create it. Right. So that's what we did. And we just thought like, that's how we're going to do this. So if you're a swim coach, you know, a junior high or high school swim coach in Mississippi or somewhere like in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. they're on a flight with you sitting next to you. You know, what, what words of, of wisdom would you offer to them for the young people on their team to kind of help them have a better experience in their athletic career? Um, trust yourself put your blinders on. <laughs> um, that's a big one because the comparison thing is very real. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, and, no, and you're talking, are you talking to the, the athletes? Are or you to saying the to the athletes? Or no, or to, to the, the coach. coach. Like oh, this coach goodness. is like, Hey, you know, you've been down this whole track. What can I do to help support mm. my, my kids, my athletes? in a way that doesn't lead to some of the things you, you experienced. Tricky part about coaches in high school and club is they have hundred athletes. Mm -hmm. And so when they ask this question, the hardest part is saying, listen and sit down and talk to them individually. Cause that's a really hard thing for them to do. So the thing I always go back to is that accept how each athlete is and how they operate. It doesn't mean they're not going to be successful, but start to, as a coach, become tuned into the clues of the different styles of how everybody works. Not everybody will do things the way that one person does them. Not everybody will do things the way that you want them to do them. You can learn from the athletes. Hmm. So how Sally succeeds, pay attention to that. What is she doing that Sandra isn't? <laughs> and how, how can you learn from both of these people? I think coaches can learn just as much from their athletes as athletes can learn from coaches. Let's take it back to childhood. What was it Barberry Lane in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, um, yeah. Good old Louisville, Kentucky. Talk about your favorite yeah. toy or activity that you remember as a, as a young person. So we grew up in a very active household. Um, both of my parents were athletes. And, uh, <laughs> looking back, I think of it like, oh man, we had so much fun. And I, in reality, they're probably like, here, here's a Barbie Jeep. Here's a, here's an army Jeep. Like go do something for a couple hours so I can get some stuff done. <laughs> now that I'm a dog mom over here, I sort of have that same mindset where I'm like, here, chew this for about two hours, you know, figure something out. But they, they gave us a lot of independence and, um, it was super special in that way. So we grew up. Louisville, Kentucky. Um, it's a bigger town now, small town then, swimmers, little athletes. My brother and I are very close in age, and very close. Um, and yeah, we were outside all the time. Zero time inside. I can hardly remember. Maybe a couple, you know, duck hunt and 
Mario Kart moments. But for the most part, we were outdoor kids running around the neighborhood, playing dodgeball, softball, baseball, whatever, in our little circle. Every kid is out there together, such a community. And that's something I really, um, I grew up in that. And I grew up in, in a special world like that, which was very rare. It was a shel- more of a sheltered kind of experience, but it was nice because it's like, you know, it's like Huck Finn, right? Like you're out there with, I've got my stick and my bandana and, you know, we're running around the neighborhood with our stuff. And, um, those are some of my fondest moments where we're always outside. And I think that really laid the foundation for a lot of my life because I crave that nature Mm -hmm. and being in that community. And then that small community and creating that environment for myself. Were you, Um, were you a tomboy? Were you playing with boys or girls or who were you playing with? for sure a tomboy. Um, but I will have a caveat here. Um, you know, the tomboys that are, that are super sensitive, you know, or you you try and act like you can hang, but you really just, (laughs) you just need some moments to feel like, you know, you're, you're connecting. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, yes, uh, to answer your question, 100% would play hard, do all the things, but I did not trend toward that, um, aggressive mentality where Mm. I needed to win or I needed to prove, or, um, you know, that came on a little bit later, but in the beginning, it was a very, a very, I just want to be a part of the group. Mm. And I just, that was my next question. Yeah. Yeah. What was your arc? What was your role in that? In your friend circle? Were you the, I'm down for whatever, were you the leader? Uh, were you the one that made sure everybody was included? For sure, the feeler. So making sure everybody was okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed making sure everybody was okay in my friend circle. Um, I would say I, I was a leader, but I was also a silent leader. I, I wasn't extremely, again, that like, guys, you know, this, 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 like, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. Like, let's go. You know, that was never really, uh, from at least from my memory, I had friends that were a bit more like that. And I was more go with the flow, but make sure that I, that everyone was okay. And that everyone was having a good time. And if somebody wasn't, I vividly remember times where I would run over them. Hey, what's wrong? Are you okay? you know, just, I felt so deeply. And I think that was also an interesting um, thing to experience as a young girl, because that grew up in a world with a lot of my brother's friends as well, because we're so close in age that I never knew how to do anything with that. Because especially in the nineties, that's not a thing that is even spoken about. It's like, go hard or go home, be a tough girl, this, 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 you know, finish the job, do this. And, and I, I was feeling so deeply. And so I never knew what to do with that. I think it, it always felt a little bit out of place. And so sometimes I was very sensitive or maybe get my feelings hurt and, and would have to kind of regroup, which I'm very mentally strong with. I could regroup quickly, but I couldn't uh, differentiate between like, is this sensitivity something good? Like, can I use this? I feel so much. Um, I get tired so quickly from feeling everyone's emotions as a young girl, adults, kids, friends, whatever it is. I felt that. Um, mm-hmm. so I think my role was very much a feeler, very much, um, you know, someone that I, I felt like I could, I could help people. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's funny to think and back you- on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have vivid memories, you know, like exactly where I was and what I was doing and, and under this big tree in our neighborhood, we had this circle, this cul-de-sac, you know, kind of thing, but it's like a driveway circle we all played in. And it was progressively sinking because it would get wet. We lived in a valley, you know, Louisville's wet and damp and it was just <laughs> sinking and muddy and we would play in that thing all day. And it was like kind of the, the home base for our neighborhood community and all the kids would go there. Um, and we had a different, different person in different shoes um, with different roles, like you said. Mm. So. And you, uh, you said you felt like a bit of a fish out of water as well at school, right? You went to some Catholic school or something like this. Yeah, I, it's, I always have kind of mixed memories of this experience in my life because I grew up in a Catholic grade school, which I'm extremely grateful for my friends, the community, 
but I never felt um, like I fit in. Like I, I, ne- I never felt like I fit in all the way through high school. I never knew how to fit in. I think there was a sense of fear surrounding who I was again, that sensitive person. And also I, I didn't know how to actually um, hang with like the cool kids. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't like it. I remember being very afraid even of going to adult parties and there'd be adults drinking, you know? And I was like very afraid of that as a little kid. Like I didn't like that because I knew what that meant. It's like, I knew something was out of control and, you know, it it can be such a silly um, thing to say out loud because it's like, yeah, whatever, you know, adults are going to drink. Like, you know, you go to a little neighborhood party, there's adults there with beers in their hand. Same thing with school. I felt like I didn't know how to fit in with the cool kids or with the group of people that were always doing something different. And I was just, okay, wake up, go to swim practice or, you know, go to school, go to swim practice, come home introvert. And I was confused about how to do that. Cause I was social, like people liked me, but I didn't know how to fit in with them. So it was like the self-imposed pain that I was constantly putting on myself. Um, and, and I think that continued on through my life, but I, I was so grateful for the experience, but I think I struggled to feel like I fit in. I had this creative mind. I was at a math and science school. There were very strict rules. And I'm like looking at butterflies, not paying attention that the, the constant conversation with me was Caroline, Car- Caroline, come pay attention, you know, over here. We're doing, we're doing this over here, you know, and I'm looking out the window or I'm doodling on my paper. I'm daydreaming. I'm doing all of these things that we're not, we're not, you know, of course they're not like, okay, when you're trying to pay attention in class. So that was something that, um, yeah, I think that carried through, but there was an interesting dynamic there with trying to fit in. Mm. And your parents dropped you all off at the pool all day long, right? Like, from morning to night to, to this is the, the quarry pool in uh, the local mm-hmm. quarry pool in Kentucky. That's apparently really famous. It's an incredible pool. Yeah. We have this um, rocked out quarry that is, we call the lake. It's called lakeside. It's not a lake, but it's a quarry. And, you know, the sides of it are all cliffs and ridges and rock. And the bottom of the pool is rock. Um, there's no heater was heated by the sun. So it was freezing right when they filled it up every year. And you know, there's just a, a cycle of time that they fill it up and then they, everyone moves indoors during the winter. But that was like just the Mecca. I mean, if you swam at Lakeside, you were so lucky. And um, were there lanes cordon off or there's just a yeah. big open yeah, there were lanes. Um, one section had 10 lanes. And so they kind of mm-hmm. like put some cement in, measure it out 50 meters. And that's where I grew up and trained in the summers. So it was a super mm-hmm. special time. And that was sort of before there were a lot of other pools. I mean, that was the pool. Now there are several other institutions and pools and clubs. And that was like the thing that we all, it was like, oh, you still know the lake? Whoa, yeah, you're so lucky. I didn't really realize how lucky I was then, but looking back, it was a really special upbringing. You're in nature every day, twice mm-hmm. a day in the summer with cliffs and trees. And, you know, it's like this like a fairy tale looking pool, bright blue, you know, I'll show you pictures. It's really beautiful fountain, you know, over in the corner, there's this huge area where everybody gets to play and there's fountains and um, diving boards and all this stuff. So, um, I was very, so growing very up- lucky. Growing up with athlete parents, was it a foregone conclusion that you and your brother were going to, you just had to pick whichever sport you wanted to to excel at, but you were going to play sports in some form or fashion? Yeah, I think it was a lead by example kind of situation. I can't recall, um, you know, we grew up in a a pretty, um, I wouldn't say like, strict by any means, but we were very routine oriented. So there was no force, like you have to do this Mm -hmm. as far as swimming went or soccer, tennis, or whatever other sport we played. But the message was, this is good for you. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this too. So we're going to go, mom and dad are going to go play tennis and you guys are going to come and you're going to sit and watch us. Or you're going to come, you know, when we were toddlers and kids, like that was part of our daily life was just going to do things that were active. So I think because we learned by example, that drive, which both of my parents are very driven are, you know, it was just ingrained in us, I think from a young age that felt really, really special. And also, and it was nonverbal, like there was no, you have to do this. There was just the expectation that this is something that's healthy for you. This is something that's powerful for you. And that's what I at least remember from, from the experience. You know, there's obviously so many other layers in society and, and, and things I could go deeper into, but um, from them, that was the message. And how are you personally defining success these days? Personally defining success. That's a great question because I can't, I still battle the, what can I do to make sure that I am succeeding in the way the world wants me to succeed? And how can I show it on social media? And how can I make sure that everybody sees what I'm doing and started to sort of put that down <laughs> and, and, I succeed and I view success on the way I feel. Mm. I can tell in my body when I'm anxious. I can tell in my body when I'm not feeling um, complete and whole, when I guard and restrict. When I feel fluid with what's happening in my life, that to me is success. That's when things and manifestations open up. That's when things come to me because I'm open to receive them. Mm. And I can receive that is when I am successful when I am blocked and restricted and tense and unable to receive closed off. That's when I'm not. I, I clearly that. must be receiving if she's jumping. on me right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I think if, if I was, if I was God and I was going to design someone to help, young people <laughs> understand high pressure situations, I would create someone and put them in all sides of that situation, the highs, the lows, every aspect of it so that they can be the most relatable person to, um, to these younger people who are, who are embarking yeah. upon this path. So, um, yeah, think, it's an awareness. It's aware. It's just awareness. It's becoming aware of, What's well, and it on? started very young, you know, it's like you, yeah. you you're kind of destined <laughs> to, to go yeah. through all of the things you've been through. And I mean, your, your parents are both professional athletes and this yeah. beautiful pool is down the street. And um, yeah, you kind of had to, you kind of had to, I tell people sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, I was um, actually, this is one of the experiences that probably stopped me from pursuing sports. I used, I was, playing recreational baseball with my brother and some other friends just at the yeah. elementary school across the street after school one day. And I was playing catcher and he was at bat. He swung the, swung the bat and let it go. And it hit me right on the, on the third eye, right on the, oh, on the middle of the God. forehead. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, how fitting. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, looking back now, obviously it wasn't pleasant at the time, but looking back now, I was like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe God and me and God got together and decided, okay, I want to open up my third eye, but I don't want to go through all the, you know, all this meditation nonsense. I want to get it over with right away. So let's just knock, <laughs> let's just take care of it. Yeah. When I'm eight years old. Just knock you right in the head. Yeah. You yeah. woke up too. We both, we both exactly. had a similar awakening <laughs> at different ages. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's interesting. I do. I do think that's a very, very observant thing of you. <laughs> yeah. I think the way yeah. it's, this stuff is designed is, uh, you know, definitely there's some divine timing happening there. So um, anyway, yeah. I want to acknowledge you for continuing to um, keep putting one foot in front of the other <laughs> yeah. in, in an effort to just be of service, you know, because that in and of itself is a very difficult thing to do, to get out of your own way long enough to use your experience to help other people and inspire 
other people in, 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 in unconventional ways. So, yeah. um, so yeah. thanks for, for making those calls to the hotline every other, mm-hmm. every other night when you had to, yeah. and doing whatever you had to do to stay, stay locatable so that we can continue yeah. to learn from you and your experience. Um, well, thank you. I think, um, I'm just striving to continue to feel my way through that and, and, uh, release the need and the, the pressure to intellectualize my experience and, uh, force, Mm -hmm. um, explaining it and like in a way that's proving, um, it's, it can be a difficult thing to do Mm -hmm. when you want to help others, but, uh, also they have to learn how to help themselves too. So I think leading by example, which you do a fantastic job of just leading by example and trying to just be who you are. And that is enough. And that presence will be felt. Um, It's a big goal of mine is I do not want to turn into a robot of what the world wants me to be. I just want to be able to uh, experience life in a way that allows me to be of service through others, through example, and through feel <laughs> experience. And you're doing way. it and you're, you're helping to change the conversation around mental health and sports and, and just mental health in general, which I think yeah. I try to encourage as many people as possible to talk more about it. And mm-hmm. uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for yeah. your transparency, your vulnerability and, uh, and your mm-hmm. enthusiasm around this, this conversation becoming more and more widespread. Yeah. It's an important one. I think we're mm-hmm. all still figuring out what it exactly means mm-hmm. in many ways, but it's a very important one and I'm excited to see it evolve. And I still, looking for, I'm, I'm looking forward to swimming with you in the ocean one of these yeah, days. Yeah, <laughs> we got to do that. You know, there's been more and more sharks out there though. I'm not going to lie. But, Have oh. you seen them? Seen a lot of videos of them right in our area. <laughs> I have okay, the drone videos and stuff of, of you guys out there open water swimming and sharks right next to you. That's uh Adam Skolchnik. You've probably seen some of those. Yeah. Um, I was talking to him at Rich's birthday dinner recently. Uh and he was like, Oh yeah, there's no big deal. I'm like, no big deal. <laughs> I need that level of bravery. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm pretty in- impressive i'll get well, we'll, there someday but we'll go we'll out there it. where there's no yeah. sharks we'll make sure yeah we'll do it i don't care <laughs> whatever excited. you know this is, makes for a better story right they're not get looking attacked for by us. a shark yeah right they're not looking for us they're, it's their <laughs> playground we're just guests in it i keep reminding myself that it's not my home it's theirs <laughs> so yeah all right well thank you so cool. much if you like that video you're gonna love the next one click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.